Um, hello, everybody. Uh, are we good to go? OK, cool. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, this is PCR9, how a simple misconfiguration can break TPM full disk encryption. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Max Arnold. I'm a security engineer at Security Innovation. Uh, we're a relatively small AppSec consulting company. Um, you can reach me at mArnold at securityinnovation.com. Also, I'd like to say thanks to my company for giving me both uh, the server hardware that I, I did this research on, as well as giving me some time to do the research. And thanks to Maxwell Doolin for providing support uh, during the research process. Um, so this talk uh, does have some prerequisite knowledge. Um, you should have some familiarity with Linux concepts, um, especially disks, partitions, and file systems, um, as well as some basic understanding of crypto, um, specifically encryption and hash functions. Um, if you don't have these, it might be a little bit hard to follow along, but I'm going to try and explain everything else. So the talk is going to be structured with sort of an introduction where I explain all of the background information on how automatic disk encryption works. Um, and then after that, I'll explain the problem that's very common and how to exploit that before describing the solutions at the end. Moving right on then, um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the boot process. So when we talk about a computer booting up, um, there's a series of different stages, um, and they're each responsible for slightly different things. Um, the overall goal is to end up with a, a usable computer, but when you first turn on the computer, most of the resources aren't available, um, and so you need to have different areas that spin up all the various components. Um, these all need to execute pretty much sequentially. Uh, so once one component is done doing its job, it'll, it'll stop, hand over execution to the next stage, and it won't do anything after that. Uh, this continues until the kernel, which is then going to keep running while the OS is running. So for this talk, uh, the boot process that we care about looks something like this. Uh, you turn the machine on, you reach UFI um, or your firmware. That's going to go into the bootloader. Uh, the bootloader will, will find and launch the kernel, and then it will find the, the actual init script that runs and handle, handles user processes. Uh, you might be familiar with UFI because this is where you change like secure boot settings or you can change perhaps memory timings. Um, and then, of course, your, your bootloader is going to be something like Grub. Um, in this talk, since we're talking about disk encryption, it's also important to note where each of these stages is stored. UFI is stored in Flash. Uh, this is pretty much out of scope for this talk, although there definitely are some interesting attacks and interesting research being done there. The bootloader and kernel are stored in the boot partition of the main drive. Uh, these, this is a, a separate area that the UFI is able to read. Um, it's in a known format. And then the actual init script, as well as the rest of your user data and programs, are all stored in the root partition. When we're talking about full disk encryption, um, it's actually not quite full disk encryption. We're encrypting the root partition, um, which means we're encrypting all the user data, all the programs, all the configurations. But we're not encrypting the kernel and the bootloader. And this is because we, we can't. If you have those encrypted, they can't run, which means your system couldn't start. Um, and a, a similar process actually occurs with the encrypted root partition. If that's encrypted, how do we have the data to decrypt it? Um, so what we do is we add an extra stage to the boot process um, called init RD or init RAMFS. Uh, this is a special extra little file system. Uh, it's in a standard format, uh, and it's very small. Uh, its only purpose is to set up enough of the computer that you can read that root file system and continue with the standard boot process. So for something like a, a software RAID, um, you'd have your RAID controller stored there. Uh, in this case, since we're doing disk encryption, we have the decryption logic stored in, in RD. Um, and also importantly, this needs to run, so this is not encrypted. So recapping then, uh, you turn the computer on. It's going to load the UFI from Flash. Uh, this will look around and, and find the bootloader which will run. It'll set up the system enough that it can launch the kernel. The kernel will find init RD, load that, run all the scripts there. That'll decrypt the hard drive main root partition, and then it'll find the init script and run. The second area of knowledge that we need to build out is the trusted platform module. Um, you may have heard of this. Um, there was some noise about it with Windows 11 requirements. Uh, it's a standard for a dedicated security coprocessor. Uh, there's a number of features that the TPM has, but we're only going to talk about a few of them for this talk, since most of them are out of scope. So the first thing the TPM can do is it can do key storage and management. It can hold encryption keys securely on the device um, and determine whether or not to return those back to the user. Um, it can do cryptographic computations like symmetric and asymmetric encryption, as well as hash functions. 
Um, it can do system integrity verification, where it actually determines the, the state of your machine by looking at the boot process. And it can do remote attestation. Um, we're not going to talk about that last one here. The first two are, are fairly straightforward, so I don't think they need much more explanation. But the system integrity verification is somewhat strange. So I'm going to go into more detail on exactly how that works. So the idea is that we want to be able to know, is our computer at any given point in a state that we trust? Um, or is it set up wrong, something looks off, and, and we don't want to trust it? Um, this is mainly for the boot sequence, because the boot sequence is so sequential. Um, once you get to user land, you have a bunch of processes that are all running at the same time, and it becomes a lot harder to understand exactly which code has been executed. Um, it's also important to note that, in this case, the TPM is totally passive, so it's not reaching out into the hard drive to measure things. Um, rather, measurements are written into the TPM where it stores them securely. So the system that they came up with is called Platform Configuration Registers, or PCRs. Um, there's a, a large number of these, and they are append only. So when you write to a PCR, um, you're actually giving it some data, and then it'll compute the hash of the existing value plus the new data. Um, this means that all of your writes will form a sort of chain, um, and the, the final result is based on every single write since it was initialized. Um, and the idea is then that every single step of the boot process is going to make a measurement of the next step before it runs it, so that there's a log in, in respect of the code that was run. Um, in order to make your life easier, they have a number of different PCRs, and so you can pick which PCR you write to, to mean that you don't have to look at all of the data all the time. Here's a visual to explain this a little bit better. When you first turn on the system, there's going to be a little snippet of code that's going to measure the UFI executable image. And it's going to hash that and write that into PCR0. Uh, then the is going to run. It's going to measure the bootloader, hash that again, and write that into PCR. The bootloader is going to run, hash the OS, write that into another PCR, etc. Um, now, once you're in the OS, you can read back those PCR values to figure out if your boot process is good or not. In the event that we have an evil bootloader that's been compared with, tampered with or compromised, um, we'll see how that works here. So the root of trust is going to start again, and it's going to measure the UFI, uh, and the UFI is going to measure the bootloader. Then it's going to start running the bootloader, which is not great because we know that this has been compromised. However, that measurement in PCR1 is already invalid. And since you can't delete values from PCRs, you can only extend them, there's no way for the evil bootloader to overwrite PCR1 anymore and make it look valid. Um, and, and this is the, the basis for the, the setup that we're going to be looking at today, which is automatic disk encryption. So with standard disk encryption, you have to type your password every time the computer boots. And this is not great. Um, it presents usability concerns because some devices don't have people to type passwords into. And it's just very annoying every time you open the lid to do that. So the system with a TPM is that the TPM has the disk key stored. And it will look at PCRs and determine whether or not to release the disk key based on the value of those PCRs. So if everything looks normal, it'll give you the key. But if there's an evil bootloader, it'll notice that it's different and then refuse to give the key. So the boot process won't continue. Um, there are a number of predefined PCR values, and I've, I've selected a few of the most important ones here. Um, you'll often see these referenced in tutorials. Um, and most significantly is that last one, PCR9, uh, is a measurement of the kernel files, like the image and the init RD. So that was a lot of information. I'm going to go recap that again, just to make sure that everything makes sense here. Um, here's our whole system now. We've got the TPM added, as well as all the stuff up top. We're going to first power on. We're going to measure the UFI into the TPM. Then the UFI is going to run. It's going to measure the bootloader. Bootloader is going to run, measure the kernel. Kernel is going to run, measure the init RD. And now the TPM has all of these measurements. The init RD is then going to request the disk key. And since all of those measurements look good, the TPM will release it. And then the init RD can decrypt the root partition, and we can continue booting normally. So. In theory, this is a great system. Um, your computer will boot up just fine. Um, and then, assuming your login screen is secure, uh, there's nothing that an attacker can do with a turned on computer. And if they try and turn it off and tamper with the disk, it's all encrypted, so there's nothing they can do. Uh, but there's a problem. If you go look online for tutorials on how to do TPM automatic encryption, you'll see command lines like this. They'll say, hey, use this utility, system decrypt and roll, or use Clevis. And they'll specify what PCRs you should use. And, and they'll usually say something like, oh, yeah, the default is, is PCR7, which is secure boot. That should be fine. Or maybe you'll throw in zero because you want to check your firmware. Um, 
This is missing PCR9, which means that the kernel image and init RD are not measured. Um, that's a pretty big problem. So, you know, we're attackers. What are we thinking? Init RD is not measured, it's not encrypted. It has the logic to obtain the disk key from the TPM, and it has a well-known structure. So what if we just modify that? What if we make it print out the key? Uh, it turns out it's actually very easy to do this. Uh, so this demo attack that I'm going to show off here um, is targeting Clevis. Um, if you're using a different disk encryption system, you'll have something similar, but it might be slightly different. So the first thing you need to do then would be obtain the hard drive. Um, this is not an attack you can do remotely uh, because you can't really grab a hard drive remotely. Uh, but once you have that hard drive, um, go look in the EFI partition and you can find the init RD. Um, I've highlighted it in blue here. Uh, you're going to take that and extract the files. Um, there's a tool, unmake init ramfs, that's useful. Um, you can also do it manually because these are a CPIO archive. Um, inside of the extracted files, um, there's going to be a few scripts. Uh, the important one that we clear about here is called Clevis um, in the, the path shown below. So the, the main target of the attack is this function here. Uh, there's a lot going on, but we really only care about the blue line again. Um, the rest of it is mostly just reformatting and, and modifying the data that it's getting. Uh, but that blue line is where it actually sets the value of this decrypted variable, which is the raw disk key that it's just obtained from the TPM. So all you need to do is just add a few echo statements and then a sleep so that it'll pause. Um, and when this runs, it'll now spit out the disk key onto your screen. Again, it's a standard format, so repackaging is quite easy. And once you've done that, uh, you boot the computer. When you do this, you'll hopefully see an image like this, uh, where I've got a bunch of stars, and then I've got the disk key printed out at the bottom there, 3J, ampersand, J, whatnot. Um, it's important to add a sleep statement, because otherwise it will scroll by so quickly that you can't read it. Um, but that's it. That is the actual disk key for my server at home right now. <laughs> so this is a sort of a weirdly simple attack. Uh, you're taking a little glorified zip file, adding a few print statements, and then putting it back together. It may as well be a debugging command, right? Uh, and it has, thankfully, a similarly simple way to stop. Uh, all you need to do is make sure that you actually measure PCR9. So in that earlier command, um, just add PCR9. Um, if you're using Krypton roll, it's the same thing. Um, and this completely stops this attack. And I wish that more people would say this, and that's why I'm here right now, is because online there are so many tutorials that don't talk about how important it is to select the specific PCRs that you're actually using. To go into a little bit more detail on this, um, PCRs, each one has a specific purpose. And you need to decide what do I, what am I worried about an attacker actually changing versus what am I less concerned about? Because if we look at something like the firmware, it might be very hard to actually write malware that compromises the firmware enough to then, you know, obtain the disk decryption key by like tampering with the next stage of execution in memory or something. Um, that's, that's a lot of work. And so for the average person, that's just not really a concern. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, the init MFS one is so simple that it should be a concern for the average user who is using disk encryption. Um, also remember that based on how this works, the TPM isn't actually determining if something is malicious. All that it knows is that it's changed. So if you measure init MFS and then you run an update that requires you to rebuild that, you will need to type in your password until you can re-update the TPM PCR values. Um, so... The, the more PCRs that you pick, the more secure you will be, but also the less usable it will be. And that's why I think there's, there's a trade-off to be made there. Um, a final note there is people often talk about secure boot using PCR7. In general, I'm of the opinion that this is pretty much not relevant. Uh, there are a number of issues with secure boot, uh, and you might have seen recently that uh, a whole bunch of laptops have shipped with secure boot keys labeled uh, per, a test only do not use or something along those lines of which have known secret keys. Um, so unless you actually know how secure boot works uh, and you are doing your own keys locally on your system, it's, it's probably not worth configuring. 
Um, if you want full details on each PCR function, um, you can find them at the Linux TPM PCR registry. Um, I have a link to that below. You can also just Google it. Uh, a couple of closing notes here. Um, so first off is that even when you do have a manual password system that's not automatic, um, initRD is still required to, to do that decryption logic. So I am pretty confident that a, a similar attack is possible. Um, it's a little bit more in depth because now what you're going to need to do is sort of make an implant in initRD that will save the password and then cause a process to call out later to some beacon server. But if you're interested, that might be a fun attack to set up. Um, that's why I think that even if you are using a manual password, it's probably still a good idea to try and make that work where you have both the password and the TPM. Um, that'll just increase the security of your system even further. Um, secondly, this is not sufficient to fully protect you against a physical attacker. Um, if you have a TPM chip on your motherboard, uh, there's a technique known as bus sniffing where you just plug some wires in and you can measure the data over the wires. Um, I've also done this. It is shockingly easy, uh, but it requires moderately advanced hardware or decent knowledge. Uh, so if you're actually concerned about a physical attacker doing an evil made attack on your computer, be careful. There are, there are lots of ways they can get you. Um, again, I mentioned that earlier that uh, updates may require you to enter your password at least once. Um, this is just a general usability thing with TPMs. Uh, there are ways around this, like temporarily disabling uh, your disk encryption during one single boot and then deleting the key later, but a lot of these have their own issues. So that's an area that you should look at if you're actually interested. Um, and finally, ask yourself, do I need disk encryption? Uh, th I'm not convinced that most people do because the, the main threat model that a lot of people have is someone steals your laptop and then flips it for some quick money. Uh, they're not going to go through the files. They're just going to try and get it out of the state as fast as possible so they can sell it to a fence. Um, take the time to actually understand your own personal threat model because that is where a lot of these decisions should stem from. Uh, so in conclusion, use PCR9. Thank you. Looks like we have uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, let's see here. Over there in the back. So, how do you use this method to steal your disk encryption key? You get a data block. Where are you saving that data block now? Can you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, so, the question was um, after you seal uh, a, a key to the TPM, you get a data blob. Uh, where's the data blob stored? Um, and so there's actually two different approaches you can take. The TPM has a very small amount of non-volatile storage, and you can write directly to the TPM. Um, or you can take the sealed blob and write that as a part of your init RAMFS. Um, either way, it's pretty much not possible to, to tamper with it effectively because the sealed blob is encrypted by a key that never leaves the TPM. Yes. Uh, so the, the, the easiest way to, to, to know is, is during configuration. Um, I believe there may be a way to check the policy that an object was sealed with, but it's very awkward to do so because the actual TPM APIs are, are kind of awkward. Um, luckily, updating a system encryption is is quite simple. You can just run the command again because you don't need to re-encrypt the whole drive. You'll just sort of re-encrypt the actual key. There's sort of a two-layer process there. So I don't know if there is a super easy way other than checking what commands were run when you configured the machines. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, I am, I think it's either PCR9 or PCR8. Um, you'd have to check that one. Yes, it is an option, I'm sure. Sorry, uh, the question was, is the kernel command line measured? Yeah. So the numbers are all standardized up to seven, and then eight and nine are true for Grub, as well as most other bootloaders, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, if you are not using Grub, you should probably check your documentation. Uh, the question was, are the PCR values all standardized? Any more questions? 
One more in the back. Uh, so Windows BitLocker does a similar thing, but I'm not actually aware of how it uses PCRs because you can't configure them. Uh, so it's probably not vulnerable if they did their job right. Um, there is actually a, another thing related there I'm sort of annoyed about with that, but whatever. In the back again. The question was, why not just use a hardware-based encryption standard? Um, so there's a, there's a couple things there. One, do you trust that the SSD manufacturer who's done Opal actually did it properly? Uh, there have been documented instances where uh, this didn't happen. Um, and second, I'm not actually sure if these necessarily are mutually exclusive. Uh, I think at least sometimes the, the configuration for Opal is coming from the system and how it's doing disk encryption. Um, so I need to do more research on exactly how Opal works, but there are definitely some reasons to not just trust Opal by itself. Cool. I think that's everything. Thank you very much.